I get a lot of prog metal and math rock drumming questions here. And the question I get more than any other is, why is Travis Orban? So this week, since I have none idea, I'll finally answer that question with the help of Travis Orban himself. Here we go. I'm Carl King, and this is the Carl King Podcast, where every week we learn about music, filmmaking, and creativity. If you like this show, head over to patreon.com slash Carl King and join for just $1 or $5 per month. Or send a tip through PayPal or Venmo to username Carl Kingdom. Special thank you to my illusionist $51 level patrons, both Hank Howard III and Chubode. Quick shout out to my music endorsements, Vienna Symphonic Library, Fractal Audio, Ernie Ball Strings, Tune Track, and Millennium Media. Now, let's get this episode begin. Before we officially get begin, here are three things to know about Travis Orban. Number one, Travis Orban is a drummer and human and life form who records his own outrageously complicated musical albums. They're divided into serieses called Silly String 1 and 2, Finite 1 and 2 and 3, Dotty Diddy's 1, 2, 3, 4, Projects 1, 2, 3. You get the idea. Number two, Travis Orban plays in the East Coast metal band Darkest Hour. And I can confirm that Darkest Hour is the loudest sound I have ever experienced in my life. Back in 2017, the day of our previous Travis Orban interview, I had to physically leave the area during their sound check because my entire body couldn't handle the intense sound waves. The best way that I can describe the sensation is being in a continuous car accident. Number three, I have my own slogan for Travis Orban, which I tell to people who are having drummer problems. Travis Orban, problem solved. He played most of the drums on my Grand Architects of the Universe album, which is a 45 minute piece of music. And it was incredible to drop his drum tracks into the album project and realize that they were flawless. Everything was in place, Everything was performed correctly, every tempo and dynamic change, and it had great energy. So it was by far the most efficient and easy drummer experience of my life. So if you have a drummer problem, call Travis Orban, problem solved. I'm going to put a link to a few of his videos in the description below, so please go and check them out. And now, let's hear what words Travis Orban has to say. I am here with Travis Orban. Thank you for being here. It's a pleasure. Someone recently asked me, who's Travis Orban? And I described you as, well, all he does is lift weights and sight read. <laughs> uh, did I leave anything out? That wraps it up, man. Uh, beautifully done. Thank you. <laughs> no, um, uh, yeah, that, that seems to be a, a misconception, actually, uh, the sight reading. Yeah, every piece that you've probably seen me play, audience, uh, has been thoroughly rehearsed. I'm not sight reading. Oh, that's a, that's a good distinction. You do a ton of recording from your home studio, as you mentioned. I'd like you to walk me slowly through your process of doing a drum recording session for an artist. You know, once they hire you and send you materials, what do you do? As you have already pointed out, I do request a demo, but it may be somewhat comical to uh, touch a bit on the demos that I receive because, um, well, there's one in particular that's pretty funny. I remember receiving this demo from a guy who voice memoed himself playing drums in a garage to convey ideas, which is pretty great. 
But uh, the demos that I received. I'm sorry, could... I did that. <laughs> the <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Carl. Um, so yeah, the demos that I receive can vary anywhere from uh, like a guitar profile or a MIDI file to uh, like an acoustic guitar, maybe a guitar with a scratch vocal, uh, all the way up to like a fully realized production uh, with, you know, pristinely engineered guitars and bass and uh, programmed drums with really modern samples, kind of like what you sent me for the Architects record. Once I receive the demo, uh, usually it has programmed drums. The occasion that I get a totally fresh canvas to work on is uh, kind of rare, but I savor those. But uh, it usually has program drums, and I will regard the drums as this is the general feel that I should adhere to per section. And then I kind of just, uh, you know, grab the uh, artistic bull by the horns for everything else, and I will reinterpret uh, the cymbal orchestrations. Maybe I'll pepper in some ghost notes or some additional bass drum hits, uh, maybe some toms. Can we zoom in more on that? process there. How are you actually doing that? How are you executing, putting, composing those drum parts? What are you doing there? So I utilize a program called Guitar Pro, the very antiquated uh, fourth edition, because it's just so user-friendly. And it, it seems like it's steering more and more towards being a uh, like a mini DAW, like GarageBand. And that's just not why I use it. But anyway, um, I use Guitar Pro 4, and I will sit with the demo, listen through it all the way through. And uh, then I'll start working on the parts. And I will visualize myself playing them as I'm typing in the numbers in Guitar Pro. And once you have that Guitar Pro demo, you send it over to... Two them maybe as MIDI, which you did with me, which so I can then import it into my DAW and hear what you intend to do. Correct. I will send uh, the guitar profile, a MIDI file. I'll also send a an export of uh, the MIDI converted to a wave, uh, just because sometimes some of the nuances get lost, like, for example, crash mutes. Um, and I will also send my sheet music, which is exported straight out of Guitar Pro. So it resembles Guitar Pro sheet music, but I arrange it so that it looks similar to a traditional uh, t traditional drum sheet notation. Do you arrange it just for them to see the notation, or do you arrange it for yourself? I arrange it for myself, because that ends up being the ultimately the chart that I use to track the song. If there's any revisions, then we will go back and forth, and I'll tweak whatever they've highlighted until we arrive upon uh, an interpretation that they're 100% happy with. And once we reach that point, then I get the other half of my payment <laughs> to bring logistics into this. And then uh, I will begin rehearsing the material. And then once I feel comfortable enough to where I'm not sight reading it, like we talked about earlier, and I, I don't, you know, I'm not totally zoned in on the chart, I can kind of get a little bit more lost in the performance. I'll send them a tone test. I'll, uh, you know, get my recording drums ready and I'll pick out a batch of symbols that I think best complements the music, and I will uh, hit everything. Maybe I'll play a section from the music, and I'll send them that test to ensure that they like all the tones, the symbol selection, and if that's a go, then I track it. And then after I track it, then I make any edits that are necessary, and I send them my own stereo wet mix, which I run through my plugins and my uh, master bus compressor, and I send them the multi-tracks. Now, I don't recall when we were working on Grand Architects, I remember being very worried in advance because I just didn't have control over what was going to happen and I couldn't be there. And it seemed very scary to just hand over a whole album to someone and, and say, I guess drum on the whole album and we'll see how it goes. But you were, you were able to send me demos and I don't recall if I really requested that many changes. I think maybe maybe there were a few. Do you recall anything about that? No, that seems accurate. I I actually can't remember a specific instance. I don't Yeah, I don't I don't remember going back and forth much. It was just kind of like, wow, okay. And then I actually planned to I remember I intended to fly out there and be there in the room while you were doing it, just because that whole idea was so scary. And then it turns out when I got the tracks back from you, I inserted them and I couldn't believe how flawless, like it was exactly what I wanted and, and more. 
Uh, so, so thank you for doing that. Thank you for, uh, somehow be, it's just, a, it's a miracle, you know, it's, it's unheard of. Well, it's still, uh, an honor to have been, you know, associated with you and to have contributed to that record. Uh, it's still a lot of fun to listen to and, uh, yeah, thanks. And you record in Pro Tools, correct? That is correct. The other interesting thing that I found out when working with you is, that you focus so much on the drum parts that you have, you have it so worked out and coordinated that when you record, and I don't know if you still do this, but when you recorded my stuff, you just recorded to a click track playing off of your iPhone into headphones. You didn't actually play along with the music, which is amazing considering that Grand Architects record is like 45 minutes of nonstop tempo changes and dynamic shifts it stops and starts so many times. Is that still what you're doing regularly? Yep. Yep. The uh, the only instance that I can think of that I played to any sort of thing that resembled music <laughs> is usually my own solo material. If I am uh, constructing a song that has, let's say, like a drum solo over a vamp of some sort, then I will uh, export the vamp out of Guitar Pro and I'll put I'll layer that under a click and then I'll put that on my iPod and I'll track to that. But usually it's just my dry, sterile DB90 or if there, if I need a custom click, which I need it with uh, Architects because of all the tempo changes and whatnot, um, then I'll make the custom click in Guitar Pro, export it, uh, convert to Wave and put it on the iPod and I'm good to go. That's amazing. Very, very unusual, I think. Have you ever heard of anyone else doing that? Yeah, I think I I vaguely remember. Now I, I might be conflating it. Uh, it's either Jason Bittner from Shadows Fall or uh, Travis Barker, um, one of those two guys. I think I remember an ancient Modern Drummer interview in which they said that they prefer tracking to just the click. The thing that would scare me about if I were doing that myself is, what if I interpreted the count in as as what if you're one beat off, one click off, and you don't somehow hear that first click, and then you record the whole thing, and you're like at towards the end, you're like, why is this not lining up? How do you distinguish the count and clicks from the metronome click? I don't really need to. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, if a song is a, if if a song is all one tempo, it doesn't matter. No, yeah, exactly. But if there's a bunch of shifts. Uh, that's just something that popped in my head. Like, man, I, I, w I would hope that I'm not one click off later on. I remember recording, I was shooting a music video for with Mike Keneally and Marco and Brian Beller and Fai Janzek. And we were trying to play the song with a click through an iPhone running into an amp. And because it was an MP3 or something, it would sometimes skip the first click because it was at the very first frame of, of the audio file or whatever. And so the band would start playing and it'd be, ah, oh. anyway, that was just a thought. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't, I don't seem to have an issue with that. When, when I, uh, encounter, uh, pauses or when the drums are tacit, then I'm just counting in my head, uh, you know, the number of beats or the number of bars. So I know when to come back in with authority. <laughs> Okay, but that's with a click still happening, right? The click doesn't just stop for four four bars, and you're not counting for four bars in your head. Exactly. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you that you're not able to do that. <laughs> Speaking of your abilities, I wanted to ask you some of your sort of uh, latent musical abilities. Um, I'm curious if you can hear a note in your head and sing it. Yes, I can do that. You can. Initially, I thought you meant if you could, uh, like, name a note, if I could then recreate that pitch, and I can't do that. But I, I'm getting better at that because I've been uh, shedding vocals with a tuner, and uh, but I can recreate a note that I hear in my head. Yeah, that's no problem. So that leads me to ask, can you think of the first note of a popular song like Epic or something, which is a, an E, and can you hum it and get it right? Let's see. <laughs> I don't. I don't have a way to check an E right now uh, where I am. But when my voice has settled, um, 
you know, after I wake up, because it's deeper when you wake up, uh, after it's settled, it, it tends to stay at an E2. <laughs> so I would just have to... <laughs> but I mean, are you hearing that E in your head or are you just, you know that your voice settles there? Um, I'm also hearing it in my head. Really? So, so you might have perfect pitch. No, God, no, no, no. You, I mean, you might have the ability to do that if you can hear the first note of a song and, and know what it should be and then sing that note. But isn't it still relative if you're referencing something in your head? I thought perfect pitch was like, uh, you can hear a note and then you can say, oh, that's a, a G5. Well, I think that would require the training to distinguish what all those notes are and re maybe remembering what they are. And it might be easier when you're younger. I don't know. But I just know that a lot of people, I think, typically can't think of a song and then sing the first note of it from memory. I don't think that they can. Okay. I could be wrong. That, that's interesting. I tried it with Mike Stone and he got pretty close on some of them, which, which kind of scared me. <laughs> because I definitely don't have that ability. Now, I heard recently that, or I discovered recently that Mike Patton supposedly has perfect pitch, according to Trevor Dunn, which, which also explained a lot of things. So that's interesting. I would explore that if, if I were you, because if you have perfect pitch or have the ability to develop that, that would be pretty powerful, pretty powerful tool, especially as a drummer. Maybe, uh, but, you know, as, as a musician, that, that would make life so much easier. Well, I will certainly continue shedding and uh, certainly continue working with uh, the tuner because that has that has uh, bolstered my confidence. And how would you rate your musical memory, uh, honestly, compared to other people you've played with? Are you the guy in the band who always knows every single change perfectly, or do you ever get lost? Because I'm the one in the band who's always lost. I need notes in front of me. I need people to cue me when, like, you know, when I played in bands, the drummer was always reminding me, here goes this part. <laughs> Um, well, in my band in particular, it's kind of like a jazz band. Like I, I, I have the clicks and I count them in and they follow me, you know, the push and pull and everything, which not all of our, all of our material has push and pull, but some of the earlier stuff was not recorded to a click. So it does have push and pull. And I program my clicks accordingly to have that, to reflect it. To recreate your earlier albums, you added a push and pull on your click that you play with. Absolutely. That's interesting. So I um uh, to give myself a rating, I don't know. I guess, I guess an eight out of ten because I I need to see my charts to refresh my memory. But once I see them, I'm I'm pretty I feel pretty confident. And how is your uh, bass playing coming along? I saw in the past couple of years you've started seem to be seriously practicing bass to record your own parts. Yeah, I'm. It's interesting. I uh. I could never see myself playing bass in uh, like a band, but I kind of regard myself as, well, it brings to mind an old Zappa interview in which an interviewer asked him how he uh, thought of himself as a guitarist, like if he thought he was any good or whatever. And uh, his response was, well, I'm a specialist. And, um, I kind of feel that way about my bass playing. It's like I, I couldn't play anyone else's material, but I can play the hell out of my own stuff. <laughs> What's the current hardest piece of music you've ever played or recorded on drums? Okay, so I divide this up into different categories. Sessions, it's still a, a two-way tie, Pete Peterson's Bugs with a Z, and the song Eigenvalue. And then I would say, wait, what's the song Eigenvalue? Is that his? I think it's on his, his only full length that he's released. Um, and then runner up would be, uh, okay. So I did a programming session. I just programmed the drums for this crazy Ukrainian tech metal band called blame B L A M E. Uh, at one point I kind of, uh, was kind of feeling somewhat crestfallen, <laughs> Because I was writing all these insane parts, and I knew they were physically possible, but I was like, I couldn't play this shit right now. I don't have the facility. I would have to really work at it. And so uh, I kind of formed a bone to pick for myself and made myself learn one of the pieces. 
and it's simply called three, like the Roman numerals three. And uh, I, yeah, I record myself playing my own parts that I program, which, you know, the program parts will be on the record. But uh, I just wanted to make that to prove to myself that I could still do it, I guess. So uh, yeah, that took like two weeks of daily drilling. And so that's the session stuff. I also occasionally dabble in covers slash interpretations. I don't like to because uh, with you know the YouTube copyright stuff, it's it's kind of a roll of the roll of the dice whether or not uh, you'll get something through. And I don't want to put a bunch of work into something and not it come not have it come to fruition. Not only that, do you worry about actual strikes on your channel, like? What if some publisher came through and decided, oh, you have three songs that we own and we're just going to strike you on all three of them and delete your account or something? Could that happen? Yeah, man, it's it can be treacherous. <laughs> uh, yeah. Thankfully, yeah. I don't I don't you know engage in any sort of like political discussion, so I can't be flagged for like, you know, if a bot interprets something that I said as, I don't know, hate speech or, or medical misadvice or something. I don't have that worry, but, uh, yeah, you know, the whole copyright thing is, it's pretty crazy. I, I have two videos, which they comprise an entire record. They were divided. They were the halves of the record, the front and the back half divided in two posts. And those are completely removed, even though I'm the session drummer and I have complete, you know, ex expressive or ex express, uh, permission from the, uh, you know, people who hold the copyrights to use it, the, uh, distribution service or the label, whatever is on, they just, they won't hear me out. So wow, I don't wow. know if I'll, that'll ever be able to be viewed by the public again. And then I also had a, uh, I did a Dillinger escape plan medley, uh, three songs from their early material. And, uh, that's also been removed. And I worked really hard on that as well, as you can imagine. I have qualms dabbling in the, uh, the covers, but, uh, there's one that is still up, thankfully, cause I put so much work into it. It is a cover of the Miles Davis song, Dr. Jackal, from the record Milestones. So that would certainly fall under the hardest piece of music that I've played or recorded. And then uh, next would be my solo material, which, God, there's so much difficult stuff kind of sprinkled throughout everything. But uh, I would like to highlight two parts in particular on Finite 3, uh, the first track Cosmo Crater, there's a bridge in which I'm pedaling 16th note quintuplets on the uh, on my two hi-hats for two bars and orchestrating various subdivisions on top between, you know, snare, floor, rag tom. And then on the third bar, the feet switch to eighth note 11 tuplets with uh, a dotted eighth on top and then a 16th note quintuplet. <laughs> And then, uh, and that builds an intensity, you know, the, the, uh, pedal hat asinados are continuous, but, um, the orchestrations change to, uh, match the music. So the second instance I would like to highlight would be, uh, a song on projects three. It's called florid celerity toppled by turbulence. <laughs> and in the B sections, I'm playing a repeated pattern of three eighth notes on the right side between the bass drum and floor tom. And then the left side orchestrates eighth note triplets between the, uh, I think it's a rack tom and the pedal hat. And then I think there's like a one snare hit in there to illustrate a, a backbeat. And so that's pretty tough. And uh, when that B section reprises later, I play the same thing, but the left side is now playing eighth note quintuplets against the regular eighth notes on the right side. So that is quite a brain warp. Yeah, it sounds easy. Uh, I mean, give it a shot. Okay. On the topic of touring, is there a strangest place you've been on tour, whether it's a town or a country? Strange to you that you thought, this is, this is a different experience for me. Okay. I was going to ask what the qualifier is. <laughs> I guess maybe Jakarta, Indonesia. We played a festival there called Hammer Sonic, I believe. And, um, yeah, it just kind of felt otherworldly. It's like this tropical climate and everyone's speaking a different language. But, I mean, being an American, pretty much everywhere feels strange because you're so entrenched in America when you're here. You know, you can drive 20 hours and still be in America. 
you can drive half that and be in a different country in Europe, you know, where they're speaking a different language. So I guess Jakarta is, is the answer, but uh, everywhere is the real answer. <laughs> now, from what I know, you live a pretty solitary life. So when you're touring, how do you adapt to being outside of your solitary routine? Is that an easy transition? And I'm curious if you ever get overstimulated being around people and need to take time yourself each day. How does that work for you? Well, I feel pretty fortunate in that regard. It's never been particularly difficult for me to, to transition. Um, as long as I can figure out the whole weightlifting apparatus situation, then I'm okay. <laughs> and yeah, so I want to ask you about that because I know you have a part of your day when you're touring is a workout and also a practice warm up routine before shows. So can you kind of walk me through that? And I'm also curious, how much do you actually need to work out to look like you per day? I don't work out with the same amount of gear, I guess, that I use when I'm at home. I have a home gym. When I'm on the road, usually I will wake up early and utilize the hotel gym. And, uh, and maybe that'll be my workout for the day. But, um, occasionally I'll have to bring my own weights, which I will bring, uh, you know, a few sets of dumbbells and a flat bench from home. Or if we're not starting the tour on the East coast, um, I'll buy a weight set, uh, or just, just like a couple, a couple of dumbbells, a flat bench, or maybe just dumbbells. I mean, you know, and, uh, I've done that in Europe as well. And <laughs> I will buy a weight set and then sell it to like one of the opening bands at the end of the tour. <laughs> Seriously? I've yeah, I've done that like three times. <laughs> That's amazing. Do you autograph them or anything? Uh, <laughs> I think I have autographed one set of weights. So, so you don't just at the end of the show, you don't like throw them out in the audience <laughs> like drumsticks. <laughs> like here's a, here's a rack of weights. Here's a bench. <laughs> here's a Bowflex. Unfortunately, I, I think that would re result in some sort of lawsuit. So I, I refrain from throwing weights at the audience. I either work out in the hotel gym, I bring a weight set, or I buy a weight set. Okay, so how many hours a day do you actually commit to working out? It's only about an hour. It, and maybe if you subtract like stretching, uh, then it's probably more like 45 minutes. See, that's what I end up thinking is... People probably think to look like that, you probably need to work out like five or six hours a day or something. I think that that's maybe what people have in their minds, people who don't work out, but you actually just do it an hour a day. All you have to do is like not look at TikTok for an hour and, and lift weights instead and be in incredible shape. Pretty much it, man. Have at it. <laughs> I, I started as a, uh, a really skinny person. I've, I've had uh, a low but low percentage of body fat all my life. So it's been tough to put on the size. That's really where I'm at now, just maintaining the size because I could very easily just not eat as much and probably shrink down to what I weighed before. <laughs> Have you ever had a surprisingly big turnout or positive reaction in an unexpected place? I just mean uh, surprisingly big positive reaction where you didn't think that many people were going to show up in this certain place or didn't think that people would be that into us here. Not that it was a, a, an abundance of people, but we did this uh, tour with Machine Head in 2014. And at the end of it, we were flying home and we had what's called, I think, a stopover. Like it's longer than a layover. It's like 24 hours or longer. And uh, so we had the stopover in Iceland and uh, my bandmates were still in contact with a promoter who was still putting on shows and he managed to whip up a show in some bar in Reykjavik. And so we land in Iceland, the promoter picks us up and we go to this dingy basement bar and it's just shoulder to shoulder. I, I don't know, it's a really small bar, so maybe like a hundred people, but it just looks so filled out. We're like wading through the crowd with our gear and uh, it was a lot of fun and uh, the crowd was awesome. And uh, after, after we played, there were several people more than any other gig that I can recall that uh, were familiar with 
things that I did, like projects uh, outside of the band. And uh, they were very kind and they bought me a lot of alcohol <laughs> and it ended up being a really fun night. Before this interview, I had asked you in advance to pick out three key moments from other drummers that expanded your possibilities. And I asked you to pick out some specific beats or fills or musical moments we could talk about. And your first example was Lars Ulrich. So tell us about that. So I vividly recall seeing the Enter Sandman video when it was on MTV. And then my father seemed to also have been taken by the music because <laughs> he went out and purchased the, the record. And I would listen to that with him uh, all the time. But then I saved up some of my own money and went backwards in their catalog and got the Injustice for All cassette. And it was then that I felt compelled for the first time in my life to like air drum along with the music. But, you know, prior to that, I had like kind of aimlessly beat on things. Like I would beat on desks in school and get in trouble all the time. Yeah, I had nothing to like inform this feeling. And then I guess I, I found drums through a, a love of that record and Lars's playing. And you picked out a specific fill. Can you talk about that? Yeah, well, it's really the music as a whole and the, the vibe and the, the, the aggression that it conveys, which that's really what struck me. But uh, yeah, as any drummer would know, or any metalhead would know, I, I will always point to the sextuplets and one, and then the endurance test that is Dyer's Eve. Um, but there's also a fill in a song called The Frayed Ends of Sanity that always drove me wild as a teenager. I think it's like four minutes into the song, something like that. But it's just really quick. Uh, I think there's 16th note triplets uh, played between two toms, or maybe it's one tom and the bass drum. And it just sounds so smooth and clean, and everything drops out when he plays it. So there's just so much emphasis on the drums. It's spotlighted or spotlit so hard. Yeah, I just love that little moment. You're talking about this little moment where everything stops and Lars does this little or something like that. This this little frantic. And I forgot to mention, yeah, he also uh, caps it off with two like really fast uh, crash chokes, which is awesome. <laughs> yeah, I think that the playing on that album had a nervousness to it that I really liked. I didn't hear that nervousness again on one of their records until one of the very recent ones. I don't remember what it was, but it was produced by Rick Rubin. And they seem to capture that nervous energy again. Ah, uh, yeah. I think that may have been Death Magnetic. Yeah, maybe. I haven't listened to that one all the way through, but I, I do remember liking some of the material. And the second example of a drummer who expanded your possibilities was Dennis Chambers. So what can you tell us about that? The year was, I believe, 1996. I had been playing drums for less than a year. I had some money saved up. And I went to a local instrument store and I was just kind of, you know, browsing and uh, I saw that there were in instructional drum videos and I didn't even know that such a thing existed. And then for whatever reason, uh, Dennis Chambers' Serious Moves was calling out to me and on a whim, I just purchased it and I popped it in and the first song, the one that opens the video is a John Schofield number called Trim. To this day, the way that he plays it, um, it's still one of my favorite drum performances of all time. It's just utterly amazing. He plays it with such aplomb and conviction. That whole video is just, it's a ride. It's, it's a performance video. There's like very little actual instruction. <laughs> it's, a, it's mostly like Dennis's uh, you know, anecdotes and his own playing philosophy. There's a few tips sprinkled in, but um, it's mostly a performance video. And Is that the one where he recommends to play on something such as a pillow? He does. <laughs> <laughs> I always thought that was so funny. It stuck with me forever. Me and my friends used to joke about that saying. <laughs> <laughs> it, it pays off, man. You become independent of rebound and, um, and you get those giant forearms like Dennis has. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to take a moment and tell my quick Dennis Chamber story because that guy really freaked me out too when I was younger. And I, I was always 
kind of a drum drum nerd groupie, even though I didn't play drums uh, as my main thing, but I was always fascinated by drummers. And so I went to a lot of drum clinics back in the day and Dennis Chambers came to somewhere in Tampa, Florida and did a clinic and he came out and this is not the important part of the story, but he, I remember he had a cigar in his mouth and he handed it to someone as he was going up there, like the promoter. He like had only smoked like half of it. And he handed it to the guy and then he turned back or back around and said, don't you throw that out now. And everybody, everybody kind of snickered. And then he came out and he just did a solo that seemed to go on. It may have been like 40 minutes, honestly. I don't know. And it got more and more intense. And he was like a big guy, you know, like had a big belly and everything. And I remember he was all sweaty towards the end and he was kind of like grunting and he was like doing those sweeping uh, doubles across the, the kit and like spinning them all over the place, hitting cymbals, these double, what does he call them? Drags or something? He has a, or a sweep. A sweep. Yeah, yeah, he calls it the sweep. Yeah. So he's doing that everywhere in this big crescendo. And then he ended with like that kind of Dennis Chambers thing that he does at the end of solos where he like runs off the end of the kit as he's doing this with those crazy singles. And then he like runs away at the end. And <laughs> have you seen him do that? He like literally runs, he stands up and he runs, he, he like falls off the kit and like runs into the background as he, as he's playing. He did that and the, the audience went crazy and he just sat back down at the kit and in the, and he just said, any questions? <laughs> and pe people kind of laughed. And, and finally one guy was like, yeah, how do you do that? <laughs> and then, and then he, and they, somebody laughed again and he's like, any serious questions? And somebody was like, yeah, like, well, what are you thinking about when you're playing like that? Are you thinking of a beat or, and then he, Dennis Chambers seemed to get like a little bit um, irritated and he's like, no, I'm not thinking about a beat. I'm not thinking about anything. I've been, I've been doing this since I was a little kid. You think this is hard for me? I'm thinking about having a sandwich. <laughs> and everyone's just like, what is going on here? And someone asked him, like, well, how many hours a day do you practice? He's like, I don't practice. I have a, I have a drum kit in my ho at home in my basement, and I only see it when I walk past it to do laundry. <laughs> and it was just like one of those ridiculous savant moments where you're like, wow, this guy is just insane and doesn't know how he does what he does. It's just, anyway, it really stuck in my mind. So when you said Dennis Chambers, I was like, oh. I, I, I totally share in that. That sounds like, that sounds like classic Dennis Chambers right there. The, the responses and, and yeah, I have seen, I think it's called Zildjian day in London, something like that. I think it was shot in like the, the mid nineties. It's him and a couple of other drummers. I think Simon Phillips is one is another one, but yeah, he, he, at the end of the solo, he did a, you know, a blistering single stroke roll across the whole kit. And then he just like got up and kept walking, but he didn't like walk completely off the stage. The third example of a drummer who expanded your possibilities was Virgil Donati. And there's actually a specific double kick song both of us were blown away by. Can you tell us about that? So my first exposure to Virgil was the Modern Drummer 1997 Festival Highlights video. It was just extremely alien playing to me at the time, but I was still quite struck by it. And then I really connected with him on Planet X's Universe record. I believe it came out in 2001. And there were there were a lot of standout moments on that record. It's it's like quintessential Virgil listening material. But um, yeah, the, the, the tune that you uh, mentioned is called Dog Boots, and he sustains an inverted double stroke roll on the bass drum for almost the entire duration of the song. There's like a one bar uh, break, <laughs> and then it's right back into the, uh, the double stroke roll at 200 beats per minute. Now, hold on. Inverted? Because I, now that sort of, I think, if I'm, I, if I understand this, that means that the strokes are sort of interlaced where it's the right and then 
not interlace, that would be flams, but uh, instead of starting with two rights, it's a right and followed by two lefts, and then it repeats. Oh. Or right, left, left, right, right, left, left, right, right. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay, so it's just staggered. It's moving the whole pattern over one sixteenth note, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so instead of, because I've heard of the inverted doubles where, oh, I see what, I was thinking of that inverted doubles with the hands and feet where you're going right tom, right kick, left tom, left kick. Really fast. That weird thing. Yeah. So that's not, that's, what is that called? That's called, uh, I've heard people refer to that as inverted singles, but. Okay. 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 You were freaking me out for a second. I was like, how would he possibly be interlacing the doubles, like putting the doubles in between each other? But okay, go ahead. Um, yeah. And you can do that fill in particular in a variety of ways. I actually, I usually start the foot. The first bass drum stroke, I usually start opposite of the hand. So if I start that, no, not inverted singles. They, I've heard it referred to as linear singles. And so, yeah, if, if I start my linear single run with the right hand, I will follow up with the left foot on the slave bass drum pedal. I believe the purpose of the inverted doubles, his reason for playing inverted doubles, I think it's an acoustic purpose because... Usually when you play quick doubles with the foot, at least uh, the way that he plays them, when you actually play each note and you don't do heel toe or you drop the heel down and, and just kind of fart out the second stroke, <laughs> you actually play each note. Um, when you play it like that, the second stroke has more emphasis. And so uh, rather than creating this strange dynamic pattern where there's uh, an emphasized uh, second 16th note at 200 beats per minute, why not move the whole thing over and emphasize the downbeat? Okay, but here's what I don't understand. You're talking about, you had explained earlier that most drummers that play double strokes on the kick util utilize that heel toe, duh, duh, this kind of bounce, uh, or wait, is it toe heel, duh, duh, like that? Yeah, well, it's not so much a sliding motion because that's that's an actual technique that works well as well. But the heel toe is like you drop the whole leg with your uh, heel slightly elevated, and so yeah, you're hitting yeah. with, the, with the ball of your foot, and then you just drop that heel down to get the second stroke. Okay. So how? Do, what is he doing differently than that? He's doing more along the lines of what you mentioned, that sliding motion. Okay. Okay. So he's hitting it and then following it up with the, you know, the backside of the foot. But it's, it, it's an, it's a motion that is, it, it's quite different from heel toe. And I can't really put it in the words. Um, you just have to experiment for yourself, but drummers know what I'm talking about. The difference I've tried to learn heel toe and I just like that sliding motion is so embedded, especially in my right foot from doing the like Virgil style exercises for so many years, it's really hard for me to, to phase that out and, you know, hone in completely on a heel toe thing. I honestly, in all these years, I don't know that I've actually heard of heel toe. Maybe I've seen Thomas Lang do it because I think he does a lot of heel down stuff also, which is strange. Um, but that's interesting. I, I had never considered that. Yeah. And I would slightly, uh, amend what you said but you're you're wait so so what, what you're calling heel toe right is really like leg toe right or leg heel leg he, leg leg heel yeah okay okay interesting and it's not I, I would say not most drummers play heel toe i would say most modern metal drummers at least <laughs> there's a lot of guys in these crazy tech metal bands that that utilize the technique on that Planet X record you're talking about, Universe, there's a song called Clonus, and you there were a couple of moments in there that you mentioned. What were those about? Yeah, there's, uh, I think it's a bridge section, or, or there's a guitar solo happening, and it, it kind of resembles a bridge. <laughs> but um, yeah, he there's there's an inter interesting buildup into a drum break where he's playing 
a double bass pattern that has accents in it, which I had never heard prior to that record. And then uh, it leads nicely into this drum break, which I honestly couldn't tell you what he's playing because I have not sat down and transcribed it for myself. But it sounds like uh, 60th note triplets orchestrated in a you know a variety of ways across all of his drums. And it just there's something about it that it just sounds so greasy. <laughs> I just love the way it it, it sounds. It's kind of it kind of had the same effect on me that the Freight Ends of Sanity did, but in a different way, I guess. Some of my own thoughts on Virgil. I've done a bunch of stuff with him uh, as far as video wise. I did a bunch of video production for him over the years and got to know him. And it took me a while to realize that Virgil actually has a looseness to his playing, and he's actually not metronomic, and he's also super dynamic. Um, he recorded some tracks for me for a re-recording of that song, Broccoli. And I think I called it Cabbage Worm Eggs for Sale on uh, the Grand Architects record. And it was then that I just realized that uh, Virgil is so dynamic with his playing. He plays so lightly sometimes. And then when he, by default, and then when he hits a kick really hard, it is super powerful. And that was surprising to me because I never realized that until I actually had his tracks in front of me. And another thing about Virgil that I want to point out is that years ago, I shot this live in the studio session with Virgil and his band, and it was at Simon Phillips's place. And they did some unbelievably completely improvised pieces from start to finish. And he had, you know, a keyboardist and a couple of guitarists and a bassist. And they had never played this stuff. They would just start playing. And it was so hard to believe that these guys are making up all of this complex jazz music on the spot. And it was flawless. It had intros, middle sections, and outros. That It was just like, how did they just do that on the first take? I'm not sure that the full set is available publicly. But I know that there is at least a trailer for it on Virgil's YouTube and he called it On Impulse. Have you ever seen anything about that? Uh, yeah, I've, I've seen the, the trailer. But uh, nothing, no other material, I don't think. No, unfortunately. One of those unbelievable things that a lot of people might not know about is, is that he plays with, plays to that level of improv creatively in the moment with musicians that can create a whole song in the moment. It sounds stupid to say that because... Oh yeah, my brother can just pick up the guitar and he can just play anything. Like that's one of those sayings, you know, it sounds cliche, but to the level that they did it, this Alan Holdsworth style jazzy fusion was just like, how, how are they doing that in front of me right now? How did this just happen? Yeah, Virgil. And I, I don't like making declarative statements, but, uh, he was he, in my lifetime. He's the last person I've seen come along to to wholly elevate the entire craft of drumming. Like there's just there's so much to take, so much to digest, consume from his playing. Um, yeah, I could gush about him for days. <laughs> he has my perpetual respect. Yeah, I remember in an interview I was shooting with him. He said something about he's always in search of the ideal performance, I think is what he said, the phrase. And it sounded almost like a life philosophy, like everything in his life, he's like such a Olympic athlete and mentally focused about making his whole life is about that ideal performance. It's beautiful. Yeah. Do your songs have meanings to you or does the instrumental music represent things beyond the music? Some, some songs that I've written, the meeting is, uh, pretty blatant. <laughs> like, I uh, just put out a song called hauling ass or hauling ass, uh, on daddy Diddy's four. And, uh, it's pretty obvious if you read the lyrics, it's, you know, just about trying to catch a plane, <laughs> but, um, some things that I write, I find that the meaning, uh, isn't, isn't that blatant. It, it requires me to record it and release it for it to mean something to me. And then even that meaning can then uh, evolve with my life. And so 
but yeah, everything has an inherent meaning because there's an inherent impetus behind it to, uh, to manifest it. So that answers the non-instrumental material. As far as the instrumental stuff, that same, uh, you know, original drive is there, but I, f I feel myself being pulled more towards, uh, vocal driven music because I feel like my, uh, musical education is not at the level that I would like it to be, to be able to write instrumental music that has as deep of a feeling or is as deeply emotive as a uh, vocally driven music is. And that, that will be something to work on in the years to come. Okay. So if you sit down with your laptop and you're on a couch somewhere on tour or wherever you are, and you're like, I have an hour to work on some music. What, what is motivating you to, to open up the laptop and, and type in your rhythms or is it, does it symbolize something to you or are you purely thinking about the notes? Are you like, Oh, I want to express what it's like to be angry or, or it's about this person I knew I want to represent them musically, or is it purely sounds? There are a number of things that can strike that initial match of inspiration. Um, recently I've been, uh, voice memoing myself, singing melodies, and then I'll then recreate those while holding a, like a tuner. And so that I know what the notes are. And then I will, uh, flesh a song out with, you know, either using the notes as the part of a scale and then, uh, imposing limitations, you know, only use those notes within the scale, or I will, uh, see how those notes coincide with a certain, uh, key and what that key, you know, the, inherent mood or vibe of that key what it represents but that's yeah that's how i tend to use theory is really to impose limitations rather than know what the boundaries are um, i think that's probably because i just don't use it enough all right i'd like to move on to some very strange patreon questions from my patreon supporters the first one comes from modiac and he asks if and when humanity makes contact with intelligent alien life, what kind of music would they share with us? Specifically, what sort of drum rhythms and patterns would alien cultures use considering a different perception of timing and range and hearing? Thanks for answering my weird questions. Travis Orban, tell us how that's going to play out when the aliens arrive. I think we'll be able to uh, taste rhythm that will be the gift that they'll bestow upon us. That's, that's a really actually a great answer. And we're going to move on. Thank you, Modiac for the very, uh, easy question. That was a, that was a softball question. Let's, let's try a little harder. Dan Raynone asks, would Travis ever consider playing his music live either with a band or just playing along to his laptop? Well, the laptop situation would be more like a clinic. I think, which I would do as far as a live band. I have no idea who would play in it and if I'd be able to afford, afford such an endeavor. But, uh, you know, if my music ever finds a big enough audience, I wouldn't rule it out. And the third Patreon question is from Dusty Grimm. And he asks some background questions such as, did you start drums early in life? Were there other instruments you tried or learned back then? Do you play other instruments now? Also, did you have a supportive family? Did they play music as well? And what age did you play in your very first live band? But I want to read between the lines here. And I think that Dusty might be asking about learning music in your childhood and the effect that that has on your playing. Could we maybe sum it up as that one question? Um, did you have an early start in some way with music in any way? And do you think that helped you? I didn't start playing the drum set until I had just turned 13. Uh, as I mentioned earlier in the interview, rhythm was always this intrinsic interest of mine. I would randomly beat on things with my hands. And then 
I heard Injustice for All, and I was like, okay, I want to, I want to try drumming, actual drumming on a, you know, with drums. <laughs> You're like, well, I've been beating on things. Let's put drums there, and I will beat on them. The building blocks are there, so let's give me something to actually acoustically make sound. <laughs> Once I got my kit and started playing, uh, there were. I, I think, yeah, there was one quick little phase that I went through because I wanted to join band, but the band teacher was like, you should play trumpet, like, probably because they had a dearth of trumpet players <laughs> or trumpeters. And uh, I gave that a shot and I just stunk horribly at it. And so I quickly abandoned that and uh, I was, you know, on the straight and narrow with drums. <laughs> and my uh, parents, they listened to music, but they were not instrumentalists. They weren't in, uh, musicians in any way, shape, or form. No musicians in the family. So you didn't grow up, even as a little kid, having like any sort of like little piano stuff, anything like that, that was steering you towards paying attention to music? Nope. It was just really just the joy of listening to music. And uh, I, I definitely experienced that early on. I have vivid memories of listening to music with both my parents, but uh, there weren't any any apparatuses in particular that were like, play me as an instrument. <laughs> it was just uh, it was just that very primal rhythmic force, and then that found uh, a way to express itself with drums. Well. That's a message to all you out there. Is you don't have to start playing when you're very young. You, if you started at like 13 on drums, that's pretty amazing that you got so far because I think when you hear about players of your level, they tend to, you tend to find out, oh yeah, they started when they were three or five or something. And so 13, there's hope for, for the rest of the 13 year olds out there or the rest of us. Travis Orman, thank you for being here and for taking the time away from eating as many calories as possible. It's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, it's an honor to be a part of the podcast. Thank you for all the questions to the Patreoners, Patreon itch people. <laughs> and uh, I look forward to uh, potentially working with Carl again in the future. Okay, that's the end of this episode of the Carl King Podcast. Remember to subscribe on Spotify, Apple, YouTube, or anywhere else you listen to these dang podcasts. And if you like this show, support the creation of more episodes by joining my Patreon for $1 or $5 a month. That's patreon.com slash Carl King. Or send a tip through PayPal or Venmo to username Carl Kingdom. And as always, special thank you to my $51 a month patrons, at the special illusionist level, Chubode and Hank Howard III. And thank you to all of the very good friends of Carl King for listening. And as I always say, Travis Orban, problem solved.